Right. So, um, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Father Dragos Herescu. It is on the screen. It's easier for uh, meetings going on um, over Zoom uh, for people to know um, each other, or at least to get to know their, their names. Um, and I am the principal of the Institute for Orthodox Christian Studies um, here in Cambridge. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this, um, our first conversation day. Um, this is a, for this um, year, 2020. Um, the conversation days are a series of public events, public lectures and conferences that normally would have taken place um, in situ, but obviously we've all um, transferred over to Zoom because of the um, pandemic and everything that's going on. So um, this is in a way a first for us because we're hosting these conversation days, um, conversation events um, online. Um, and we are also have another first in the sense that we're addressing this year a theme that um, one might not immediately think about. Uh, the conversation days are um, focusing on faith and film. And um, I have to declare that all of us at the Institute have a, a bit of a bias. We all, we all love films and um, sometimes over coffee we have long conversations about um, how religion or theology is present in films. So I think the, the seed of these um, conversation days this year um, was planted a long time ago. We decided to take a leap of faith as it were and go with this topic and maybe um, it was fortuitous because everyone's locked in uh, and many people have rediscovered their film archive, their DVDs or their streaming services. Um, and um, film has become yet again, one of these mediums that we engage with uh, more than we probably did before. And um, another thing that determined us to um, go for this topic was that, um, um, as an art form, we really believe um, um, at the Institute, we, we when decided to have this conversation um, theme, we really think that theme, that the film captures the human fascination with meaningful narrative uh, these days. And in a consumerist society, in, a, in, a, in an age where people have hardly time or patience to watch a two minute clip, um, to watch a film is often, can often be a transformative experience for many people particularly if that film carries a narrative, a meaningful narrative, and often meaningful, meaningful narratives um, address uh, biblical themes or themes about the human um, being, about human destiny, where we come from, where are we heading? So in this context, we decided to address this topic. Now, you'll certainly find more, and this will be unpacked both today and in the two coming sessions. Um, that we have um, in this series. Um, so I will stop here with the introduction and I will say just a few words about the two speakers um, this evening. Um, you might be very familiar with them, um, certainly from um, our little interaction um, now before we started recording. I can see that you're familiar with either one or both of them. Um, but I'll just say a few words first about um, Professor Roland Weimer. Um, we're delighted to welcome him at the Institute uh, for this event um, for the first time, um, although he's no stranger to the wider context of the um, Institute, both within the Cambridge Theological Federation um, and obviously in Cambridge. Um, Professor Weimer uh, has um, taught and supervised for the um, uh, Cambridge Theological Federation, but he um, also supervised and taught at Anglia Ruskin University um, most recently um, in the uh, Humanities and Sciences School, the Faculty of Arts, Humanities and Sciences. And um, his research interests are um, English Renaissance drama, science fiction, film, and religion and literature. And um, he will um, probably say maybe a few words about himself um, by way of introduction. So I'll stop here now. And um, the second speaker, Dr. Resvan Porum, is um, an old friend of mine um, and work colleague. Um, he is the vice principal of our institute and the lecturer in 
Ecumenism and Practical Theology for the Institute and the Cambridge Theological Federation. And um, Rizvan's interests very much pertain to the inter-Christian dialogue and interfaith dialogue and how this impacts our practical life, both as individuals, but as churches and as communities of faith. And his latest uh, publication um, was last year. Um, his book, Orthodoxy and Ecumenism Towards an Active Metanoia. Rizvan is also a keen, a very keen um, um, sort of lover of, of film, as I said, and I'm sure he will um, share some of that um, love um, in his presentation tonight. Um, we're focusing on um, sort of two topics this evening. Um, Professor Weimer will say something about the intersections between film and theology and film and religion. And Rizvan will focus on um, the very um, classic uh, Blade Runner. And I'm sure this will uh, lead to some wonderful interaction and conversation. So I will um, stop here and I will offer the floor to Professor Weimer. Um, thank you very much. I hope everyone enjoys this and finds it a very stimulating event. Thank you. So, um, can everyone hear me okay? Or not? Uh, okay. Um, what view are you getting? You're getting a full screen view of me at the moment. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry about the uh, lack of a haircut, and uh, but I have checked. I've got my trousers on, unlike that uh, uh, <laughs> Irish MEP this week. Uh, okay, so this is quite a general lecture, um, but I'd like to start by saying just a little bit about where I'm coming from. I've always been very passionate about film as an art form, and uh, for ten years, with the help of Nigel Cooper and Zoe Bennett, uh, I ran screenings at Anglia Ruskin of um, films which were meant to engage very seriously with moral and religious issues. And we started with a whole run of great classics like Andrei Rublev, Seventh Seal, uh, The Gospel According to St. Matthew, um, Dreyer's The Word, Passion of Joan of Arc, Brunwell's uh, Nazarene and Viridiana. Uh, but then we also moved on to some very good modern films like Calvary and um, uh, Jessica Hausner's Lourdes. Um, and I, I did find these films a very powerful intellectual and emotional stimulus to trying to think about what I might actually believe in, why I might believe in it, or why I might not believe in it for that matter. Um, and since the age of 12, I've also been very passionate about science fiction and um, have um, been particularly preoccupied with how science fiction treats religious topics. Uh, and perhaps tries to recreate certain forms of religious experience. Um, and I have actually sent a book proposal to OUP recently uh, for a book on this subject, and a couple of chapters have already been published as articles. However, and it's rather ironic in relation to this particular event, I haven't actually been so enthusiastic about science fiction in film and television. Um, with a few major exceptions, most of which, in fact, we will hear about tonight, I think. Um, I, I, I used to think that basically film and television science fiction was never as good as the best written science fiction. I mean, by the 1970s, science fiction was really quite a sophisticated literary form, uh, but a film like Star Wars was seen by me and others as pulling science fiction back to the crudest pulp fiction of the 20s and 30s, uh, even, if, even if it did help to bring um, SF into mainstream culture more. Uh, now, I think film and television science fiction has improved a lot in recent years, uh, but there is still a basic problem, which I can try and uh, explain to you. So if I go on to this, uh, and, uh, sorry. Start from there. Right. So the, 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 the problem is that um, 
Science fiction to me is, is a form which appeals more to the intellect than to the senses. And this has been put very well by Joanna Russ. Science fiction, like medieval painting, addresses itself to the mind, not the eye. You can all see the PowerPoint, can you, by the way? Yeah. To turn from other modern fiction to science fiction is oddly like turning from Renaissance painting with all the flesh and foreshortening to the, luminous, to the clarity and luminousness of painters who paint ideas. For this reason, science fiction, like much medieval art, can deal with transcendent events. Hence, the tendency of science fiction towards wonder, awe, and a religious or quasi-religious attitude towards the universe. It's a very good um, article from the very beginnings of um, science fiction as an academic study. That's Joanna Russ. Now, film doesn't deal very easily with ideas. Uh, film is great for human emotion. Um, the close-up of the human face is the most important single shot in cinema. Film is great for spectacle, uh, but it often struggles, I think, to communicate complex ideas. Many science fiction stories take the form of philosophical and theological thought experiments, which develop new rhetoric, new languages, to deal with some very old problems like the mind-body relationship. In written science fiction, what a theologian might call a soul might be described as energy beings, cohesive energy fields, wave patterns, point intelligences in end space. <laughs> That's a good one. Point intelligences in end space. Mind scans, software, digital uploads or downloads, transcorporeal successor entities. That's another good one. <laughs> transcorporeal successor entities. Now, any attempt to actually visualize in a film what these things might look like independent of the body is quite likely to end up with um, something which is deliberately parodic. And uh, there is a very funny film called Cold Souls by Paul Giamatti, which um, does parody this whole attempt about trying to think of the soul as, as a thing which you can see. Um, Paul Giamatti plays himself uh, as a, an actor who is suffering an existential burden uh, from playing um, uncle, in Uncle Vanya's Chekhov every night. Uh, and it's actually wearing him down. Uh, so he, uh, he tries to ease this burden by taking advantage of a new medical process whereby his soul can be, or most of his soul can be taken out and kept in cold storage, uh, uh, freeing him from the anxiety of his performance. Uh, but when we do get to see this soul, um, it looks to Paul Giamatti's horror like a small chickpea. Uh, and um, the doctor exclaims, uh, how can such a tiny thing feel so heavy? Uh, but, then he, but then he hastens to reassure Jamati that size doesn't actually matter. It may be tiny, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, so I can recommend it. It's quite a funny film, uh, this. And uh, anyway, Having um, disposed of some of my reservations about film and science fiction, I can nevertheless reassure you that the films that we're mentioning tonight are all pretty good and uh, do actually deal with some quite complex theological ideas without sacrificing the visual and emotional appeal of cinema. The Joanna Russ statement I've just quoted, which uh, talked about SF appealing to the mind's eye, uh, was part of a much larger argument, which said a lot about the um, way religious ideas are almost baked into science fiction. Uh, so I was rather, and I've always believed that myself, so I was rather taken aback when I occasionally came across statements by major authors and major critics saying exactly the opposite. That's a famous one uh, from the great Stanislav Lem. All themes connected with the religion are excluded from science fiction, and what few exceptions there are only demonstrate this rule. Uh, you don't get bigger as an SF author than Stanislav Lem, and that's what he thought. Similarly, uh, you don't get much bigger than a critic than Darko Suvin. All attempts to transplant the metaphysical orientation of mythology and religion into SF 
will result only in private pseudo myths in fragmentary fantasies or fairy tales. Now, the only way I can make sense of such statements is to assume that the writers are working with a very, very narrow definition of science fiction and a very, very narrow definition of religion. If you um, use by far the simplest and most accurate definition of SF that I work with, science fiction is a form of fantastic fiction which exploits the imaginative perspectives of modern science. It seems obvious that um, religion would be likely to play an important role in many SF stories, if only as the supposed an antagonist of science, because stories need conflict. They need thematic conflict, they need narrative conflict. And um, if the story is basically shaped within a scientific worldview, uh, then it needs something to counter that. And religion is one of the most obvious ways of bringing that kind of conflict into a story. Of course, it all goes far beyond that because actually, because science fiction is a philosophical genre and philosophy overlaps so much with theology, uh, I think there's something inherent in the genre quite independently of whether it needs a, an antagonist or not, it's actually baked into the genre. So metaphysics and theology have arisen naturally out of the genre's common themes. The limits and ethics of science, time, eternity, creation, and out of its radically future orientation. Obviously, this radically future orientation is something central to science fiction. And some critics have particularly emphasized the religious significance of this future orientation. An orientation towards the future, openness to that which is beyond us, is, according to the Christian theologian, of Hart Pannenberg, essential to what it means to be human. And moreover, he says it defines humanity as essentially religious. Now, I agree with the first part of what he's saying. I'm not so sure about the last part. Um, I agree that an orientation towards the future is what defines us as part of what defines us as human and distinguishes us from every other animal, that we, no other animal has that orientation. Uh, but does it really define us as essentially religious? I mean, couldn't our, this orientation towards the future take the form, as it often does in science fiction, of a determination to conquer the galaxy and create more Lebensraum for the human race by exterminating all the little green men who live on the other planets? Uh, I, I, I'm, I do question that last part. I don't know whether Razvan would have a different view, but anyway. Anyway, I'm going to move very briskly through four of the many ways in which science fiction engages with religion and, which, and, ra and the way it raises important theological questions using my examples from film rather than literature before spending a little longer at the end on 2001 as my last example. So um, you've got these four headings. They're not completely random headings, but they're not exhaustive by any means. They're slightly different from headings I've used in, on another occasion. Uh, and I could add half a dozen more probably, but these are four of the ways in which science fiction does actually deal with religion. And the first of them, closed societies. I mean, depictions of societies which are enslaved by narrow and oppressive forms of religion used to be quite common in written science fiction. It was part of the way in which science fiction liked to think of itself as the voice of a rational secular future challenging primitive and irrational closed belief systems. Such depictions seem to me rather less common in film, but my, my one example I'm using here is a really extraordinary film. This is uh, the Russian film Hard to Be a God, uh, directed by Alexei German to 2013, based on a 1964 novel by the Strugatsky brothers, uh, who of course were responsible for the source novel for Tarkovsky's Stalker as well. Now, in the film and its source novel, the situation is that observers from Earth are going around an alien planet in disguise, uh, an alien planet which is trapped in a particularly squalid and brutal version of the Middle Ages. Their anthropologist protocols uh, forbid them from interfering in any major way with the society around them, or they're trying gently to nudge it towards a renaissance, but the renaissance never comes. 
because periodically all artists and intellectuals are rounded up and killed. Uh, we accompany the chief observer, that's Don Rumata, who looks more like a Renaissance prince than any of the other characters, uh, through three hours of black and white medieval squalor, horror and grotesquery. It is absolutely extraordinary, this film. Many people would find it unwatchable. Uh, that, that's, that's sort of an example of a... <laughs> uh, I mean, basically, only the brilliance of the filming, and I think it is a brilliant film, only the brilliance of the filming makes it bearable, I think, because the plot largely disappears. And it's just one brutal image after another uh, until you get three hours of it and you get to the end. Uh, quite a few people have been known to walk out of the film uh, overcome by the repulsiveness of some of the images. Well, the apparent point of the original Strugatsky novel uh, in 1964, or at least the point as it would have been read by the Soviet censors, seems to have been how difficult it is for an enlightened rational force, as Soviet communism imagined itself to be, uh, to drag a society like Russia out of its backward medieval superstitious past. But of course, from the very title onwards, there is massive um, incitement to theological reflection. It is actually hard to be a God. What power of intervention does God have in the world? How far should he intervene? Is he mainly just an anguished observer? Or does he make little nudges in the right direction every now and then? If so, what form might these nudges take? I suppose you could argue perhaps the birth of Jesus was that kind of nudge in the right direction, except it hasn't worked well enough yet, obviously. Um, I think if you're interested in pursuing the theology of this, um, you might be better off reading the original novel, which is much lighter in tone. I mean, it is really quite light in places, the original novel. It reads like Terry Pratchett in, in parts. Uh, the film is so dark, so heavy and so relentless and so disgusting in places <laughs> that, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to everybody, but I actually think it's brilliant. And it, 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 is, a, it is a kind of um, tour de force uh, that's quite unique, really. I don't know any, any other film quite like it. Um, so that's that one. We move on to the second um, heading, time, determinism and free will. As I'm sure you know, in modern physics, time is not at all straightforward. Einstein's theory of relativity seems to abolish the normal conceptions of past, present and future. Since the sequence in which events occur within a space-time continuum, i.e. the universe, uh, is actually relative to the observer, relative to the inertial frame of reference of the observer. So whether A comes before B or B becomes before A, or whether A and B are simultaneous, does actually depend on where you are within the continuum. It's really um, difficult to deal with, but that's what modern science is saying. Um, so let's just go back to... That. Uh, where are we? Uh, if we the screen. Sorry, just get back to a. Uh... Oh, come on. Uh... Right. So this is an Einstein quote, quite a famous one. To us believing physicists, the distinction between, between past, present and future is only an illusion. He actually wrote this in a letter to the recently widowed wife of a friend of his. And it's obvious that he's actually trying to cheer her up. <laughs> uh, and it's just like the Charles Famadorians in uh, Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five. Yes, this person might be dead at this particular moment, but elsewhere in the continuum, he's doing just fine. <laughs> uh, okay. So this is why many physicists use the concept of a block universe in which all space and all time 
is gathered together in a unity which excludes the illusory senses of past, present and future. They're just illusions, really. And the only possible way of perceiving such a block universe uh, would be from outside it. That's the only possible way you could perceive the universe uh, would be outside it. So the old idea that God is outside space and time can see the whole history of the universe at once has actually come back in a new form within modern physics. And it's come back with all the associated problems of foreknowledge, determinism, predestination, free will. In Paradise Lost, of course, God knows Adam is going to fall, but it's still Adam's fault, or perhaps Eve's fault, if you prefer it that way. So the, the two examples here, uh, there's um, Arrival. This is a particularly intelligent recent science fiction film, 2016, directed by Denis, Denis Villeneuve, who also directed the Blade Runner sequel. Uh, most of the time it's firmly focused on the problem, the very difficult problem of communicating with an alien, and the problem which is sidestepped in most science fiction films because the aliens always turn out to speak and understand American English uh, but in this film they don't and it really is a problem. Uh, however the underpinning concept of the film is the block universe uh, with all the associated paradoxes and the problems of foreknowledge, predestination and it's done in a quite emotionally powerful way I think. And of course an even more recent thing is devs uh, this very high quality recent television series which um, uh, in which this mad genius played by Nick Offerman uh, has used his research in institute and used the power of quantum computing to try to convert essentially the whole world into code. So if one accepts the block universe premise then this would open up access to both the past and the future because everything would be predictable in a deterministic sequence of events. Uh, the universe would be conceived in one, as one thing in a deterministic sequence. Now the religious implications of this are foregrounded at several points. You can see obviously by the framing of this particular shot. Uh, it's just his uh, electric light in the grounds of the research institute, but it's obviously has certain implications. And um, the fact that the rather nondescript title, DEVS, D-E-V-S, which is corporate speak for developments, can actually be read as having a Roman V, D-E-U-S, in other words. The series also um, makes explicit allusion to the breaking this deterministic sequence of cause and effect by an act of free will, an act of disobedience, an act like Eve's eating the apple, which changes everything, changes the whole universe. I'm not going to reveal the final narrative twists in this, but they do actually lead me rather neatly on into my next section, the mind, body and the soul. As mentioned earlier, SF has often been preoccupied with the mind and body relationship and has developed ways of talking about this. Uh, theologians might use the term soul, but SF uses other terms. And a recurring speculation is the possibility of converting a human mind into digital code and storing it on a computer before perhaps releasing it onto the internet. Would such a code have full consciousness? Would such a code yeah, have full consciousness? Could something discarnate and immortal actually be called human anymore? Um, or could it, would it correspond in any way to the older speculations about the soul supposed to be the essence of the human being? Or would this being approach more closely to the nature of a god as something without a fleshly body, uh, immortal, potentially omnipresent, via the internet? If so, would it be a benevolent deity or a malevolent one? Now, some of these questions are posed in a rather melodramatic form, but with a pleasing ambiguity in the film Transcendence, uh, starring Johnny Depp, 2014, which I've got on the screen here. 
Now, all I'd say here is that I don't believe that something without a body and without the possibility of dying could possibly be called human. And that, of course, makes me think very critically about the nature of a soul, what, about what the nature of a soul could possibly be. Uh, what kind of connection could it have with a human being? Isn't a mind without a body less than a human being rather than more than a human being? Uh, what exactly is being resurrected? And one of the big issues in, involved in coding somebody's mind, if it were ever possible, is that of course it would then be reproducible. If it is code, then it can be replicated. And where is then the unique human being on whom the normal theological soul, theological sense of the soul is, is dependent? So another side of this whole problem, uh, and I'm gonna probably uh, cut some of this to uh, keep on time, but is the whole issue of beings which have been manufactured in ways which are endlessly repeatable and reproducible, can they be thought of as having the same moral status as humans or the possibility of achieving that status? Do they in fact have souls? Uh, this applies obviously to in Tarkovsky's Solaris where the woman is actually an unstable neutrino system who is apparently endlessly reproducible, uh, but she becomes more human well, this version of her becomes more human the more time she spends with Chris, the psychologist on the space station. It applies obviously to Blade Runner in this very iconic shot. We, and I'm going to leave discussing that till I respond to Razvan's paper. I'll just say a, a few brief words about Westworld where the same issue comes up again. This is a pretty good recent television series, which is built upon the developed out of the 1973 film by Michael Crichton about a theme park in which paying guests can act out their fantasies of being in a Western by shooting robot gunslingers and bedding saloon girls. But the series turns the film's perspective upside down. Uh, it focuses on the viewpoint of the robots who have to service the customers. Uh, we see things from their perspective as they're beaten up, shot, scalped, raped again and again and again then their memory circuits are wiped and then it starts all over again how far do they have feelings personalities and a set of values and one of the major in ironies here and i'm speaking having only seen series one not series two is that their development of personalities and a moral consciousness as they start to access memories of their brutal treatment by the guests and they start to rebel that may itself just be part of the script which had already been written for them by the god figure who controls the whole theme park. They were meant to become more human, meant to rebel. Uh, I am, um, I am um, getting short of time here. I want to cut perhaps quite a bit of what I'm going to say on the sublime here. We could go. We could go a bit over time. Um, we can go a bit over time, can we? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, this is a, a Hubble photograph of Galaxy M one hundred and four. <laughs> Just astonishing. Um, and the atheist Richard Dawkins has spoken of his wonder and awe when contemplating the physical universe in terms which seem really very little different from the way many people would express their religious feelings. And the aesthetic effect and the emotional response known as the sublime uh, can in fact encompass both a religious and a non-religious perspective, I think. It was theorized by Burke and Kant in the 18th century as being that feeling partly pleasurable, partly painful, of the senses being overwhelmed by something enormously large or enormously powerful or enormously complex, something beyond our capacity to measure or understand. And although it had originally emerged as a form of religious discourse. You know, we look up at the night sky and we sense in its vastness the infinite and overwhelming presence of God. It can also be associated, as it was by Burke, with the mind's terror in the face of emptiness and absent. All that infinite space, there's nothing there. Now, science fiction frequently deals with colossal distances and speeds, extraordinarily powerful forces, enormous spans of time, 
artifacts of astonishing complexity. And it's very fond, perhaps a little bit too fond, of that favourite sublime word, the infinite. One of my very few criticisms of 2001 uh, is the caption which precedes the final part of the film. Jupiter and beyond the infinite. Well, what on earth is that supposed to mean? <laughs> what does beyond the infinite mean? Surely the caption should have been Jupiter and beyond, colon, the infinite. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's my view. Anyway, whether a sublime effect being strained for in science fiction comes off completely or not, and whether or not it's closely associated with the presence of God or the absence of God, it is surely central to the appeal of science fiction, as pointed out by the Romanian SF critic Cornel Robu. Science fiction at its highest is an art of the sublime. It's the particular reification of the sublime in 20th century art, and the pleasure we find in SF is a specific aesthetic pleasure, that pleasure in pain, except for, the, except for the tragic, only the sublime can offer. One form of the sublime in science fiction is the so-called big dumb object, the huge object which defies explanation and defies uh, understanding. I'm not going to talk about Solaris now because the, obviously that's one of the classic examples and we'll talk about it in the conversation day devoted to Tarkovsky, but obviously the, the planet is one of these huge dumb objects which baffles the senses, the mind, and possibly is a figure for God. The monolith in 2001 is another such object. And um, this film is a very close collaboration between Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke. At that time, 1968, you know, the most well-known science fiction novelist. Um, it, neither of them held religious beliefs, as I understand it, uh, but they both um, knew they were creating something which was very open to theological interpretation. Kubrick said in an interview, I will say that the God concept is at the heart of, very heart of 2001, but not any traditional anthropomorphic image of God. I do believe that one can construct an intriguing scientific definition of God. And I think what he means by that, what he and Clark meant by that is that the age of the universe and the number of planets and stars must mean that there are civilizations out there that are so advanced that they would appear to us as gods, basically. They would have godlike powers in relation to us. Anyway, uh, the film deliberately avoids the kind of explanations which occur in the novel which was produced simultaneously with it and simply leaves us through striking images some very big theological questions. Where do we come from? Where are we going to? Is there a higher power guiding this journey? The film makes clear that humanity is not a fixed state of being, but something constantly in process, as of course we know from evolutionary theory. And Nietzsche's view of this process was clearly, I think, very important to both Kubrick and Clark. Man is a rope fastened between animal and superman, a rope across an abyss. And that's why the film soundtrack makes such prominent use of Richard Strauss's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. So the reading I want to finish with, if I'm allowed to, do, uh, should I cut it here or, or not? No, no, you, come on. Okay, it's about five more minutes. Uh, the reading I want to offer here is not necessarily incompatible entirely with Nietzsche's, but it's a bit more close to religious thinking. So, obviously in the dawn of man sequence at the beginning, the, uh, the apes have a very insecure foothold on existence. In fact, in the novel, they're basically about to become extinct, threatened both by wild animals and rival groups of apes. Following contact with the monolith, they use their new intelligence to become better fighters, better killers, using tools to dominate their immediate environment until they progress to dominating the entire planet and building spaceships. In the novel, it's clear, in fact, that this enhanced reason and enhanced use of tools uh, has led to the manufacture of nuclear weapons. 
guided by another monolith found on the moon, they travel towards Jupiter without any real idea why they're going there. The HAL 9000 computer, which controls the spaceship, is an epitome of absolute reason. It's far more intelligent than any human being. It's all seeing, all knowing, supposedly infallible. When it falls into error and ends up trying to kill the human crew members, it is revealed to be a false god of reason, or rather reason itself is perhaps shown to be the false god. The one surviving crew member, Dave Bowman, then goes through the Stargate near Jupiter, uh, experiencing the mind-blowing equivalent of an LSD trip. Somewhere in the background, somewhere in the background, lurk Blake's famous lines, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite, and with all the countercultural baggage which those lines had in 1968, uh, definitely. Anyway, he goes through this extraordinary trip and obviously humanity's intelligence, its enhanced intelligence, its ability to reason has brought it a very long way from an ape on the verge of extinction to somewhere beyond Jupiter. But in the film's most extraordinary narrative twist, and this really is pretty extraordinary, uh, the spaceman finds himself in a chilly, vast, empty 18th century room, a kind of dead end, a cul-de-sac, a room which is symbolic of, guess what, the age of reason, <laughs> the 18th century, the age of reason. And he grows old alone there, far from the exchange of love to lie, unreachable inside a room, until uh, a monolith, the monolith reappears. The great journey which had started when the apes first understood how to use their tools has ended in a loveless dead end, but the monolith reappears. Humanity needs a new start, a rebirth, a reboot, a reset, a different set of values, and then the mon monolith appears, reappears to nudge us in a different direction. Reason got us a long way from ape men to spaceships, but it's not the God we need. And of course, then a child is born which will transform the world. So I don't need to gloss this any further. And it's not necessarily the meaning of the film. But it's certainly a way in which Kubrick and Clark found of getting us to ask serious questions about where we've come from, where we're going to, and what's out there. Um, I could finish with one last quotation, perhaps. Uh, it's one of my favourite quotations about science fiction and religion from the author Mary Doria Russell. I think it implicitly references 2001. Science fiction can bring us back to a time when humans existed, existed in a state of radical ignorance, when stars were not dimmed by city lights, and where the darkness beyond the campfire was absolute. In the darkness of the African savannah night, or in the darkness of space, or in the darkness of our souls, the questions are the same. What is out there? Who is out there? For all our sophistication and technical wizardry, it's good for us now and then to feel a fearful sense of wonder, to imagine ourselves at the edge of a vast unknown. The fearful, that fearful sense of wonder is the province of both science fiction and religion. We are still basically all huddled together in our cave, ignorant and fearful of what is out there. Thanks very much, and uh, sorry for overrunning. Not at all. Thank you so much, um, uh, Rowley. Uh, this was, has been a fascinating exploration, um, and you've presented so many aspects that can be unpacked. Um, but of course, it is incredibly vast uh, domain to explore, and I think you've done a, a wonderful job. Thank you very much for that. Now I'm, I'm supposed to respond. I don't really quite have the time, but um, I'll just say something very briefly uh, by way of a comment, really. Um, that um, I'm, 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 I'm strike. I'm, I'm, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, shocked in a sense by Stanislav Lem's um, 
you know, very atheistic sort of um, statement. And uh, I, uh, I have loved science fiction ever since I was a child. I grew up in a communist country uh, where atheism was almost obligatory. Um, and science fiction was in fact one of the forms sanctioned by the government, one of the literary forms, uh, because it was perceived as opposed to religious thinking. So um, somewhere I wonder whether Lem wasn't just saying it for the censors or whether it was his genuine, um, you know, opinion, but I, I, I'm not an expert in, in Lem. Um, but um, in any case, what I, what I could notice as someone who, uh, who's, uh, who struggled to see more than simply a way of finding, um, ways of finding alternatives to, to religion, as it were, through science fiction, uh, uh, some of the modern science fiction films, um, they uh, certainly present religious symbols or ideas, do not shy away from those. And um, very quickly, as I mentioned to you before, this film, uh, Gravity, where everything happens in a space orbital station, which is about to fall down with Sandra Bullock, uh, as the main protagonist. Um, but there are moments when she sort of skips from one uh, orbital station to another, from the Russian to the Chinese. There are moments where the director chose to show us the little icons that the astronauts had in their spaceships. The, there was a, a good old orthodox um, tiny icon in the orbital, in the Russian orbital station. Um, and there was uh, some form of religious, um, I'm not sure what representation, but there was something religious also in the Chinese space station. So there seems to be a willingness to, uh, you know, do not forbid religion from that point on. You know, this is space, this is science, religion has no longer a place in this. So there is a sort of signal there and also a signal in the film Ad Astra, and I hope I won't be spoiling it for too many of you. <laughs> I'll try not to give too much away, but it presents a future where um, the only hope that humanity seems to have kept is to find someone outside, uh, someone in the sense of uh, an extraterrestrial uh, civilization on another planet in another constellation. So it focuses all its resources in this quest, finding some, someone out there beyond the limits of the solar system. Uh, again, uh, I, I, I noticed with some wonder that religion is not absent from this universe. Um, you have all these technologized spaceships, but every journey seems to begin with a prayer. Um, some of them Christian prayers, uh, it seems. Um, and there is this sense that the, the way the film ends uh, with a focus on human relations uh, back home, that perhaps what we, perhaps the idea being that perhaps what we should be seeking is not out there beyond, um, as indeed was the uh, illusion in, in 2001, the Space Odyssey, but perhaps um, we should be looking for something within, sort of within our own lives here on Earth, and in particular in our relationships with, with the others, with those uh, surrounding us. That may, be, um, that may be how uh, Solaris ends, actually, isn't it? That may be the point in the, well, one of the points in the ending of Solaris, the um, return to Earth, the reunion with the Father. Hmm. Yes, um, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But I'll stop my comments here and I'll give uh, five, ten minutes or so for some comments or questions from the participants, if, if there are any. Okay, this is my question to, to either of you, really. Um, the, book, the, the book of the Bible that is closest to, um, 
science fiction in a kind of very broad sense of that word is the book of Revelation. And that is for a simple reason because it's taking place in the future. Um, and because the imagery of, uh, that is uh, presented to us in the book of Revelation is the imagery that would be most demanding from the point of view of any kind of realism uh, that is dealt with other genres apart from the science fiction. Can we use science fiction as a genre, either literal genre or, or film, to kind of um, supplant or supplement or clarify uh, uh, in a creative way uh, all that is um, um, presented to Christian believers in the book of the Revelation. Uh, well, Rowley, would you like to take that one? <laughs> uh, well, obviously there was a, I mean, you, you can try and bring um, historical and scientific um, expertise to bear in decoding parts of the Bible. Um, I'm not sure uh, I would necessarily do that myself. Um, I mean, obviously, the influence has worked the other way, in the sense that the Book of Revelation has been quite a big influence on uh, apocalyptic science fiction, um, and uh, is probably alluded to as often as any other book of the Bible. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think how I would actually uh, reverse engineer that uh, and um, bring science fiction to bear upon the Bible. Um, do you have a good idea, Razvan, how you might do that? I don't really. Um, I, I never thought of science fiction as supplanting anything or complementing, you know, directly or, uh, uh, you know, uh, with, with purpose, uh, biblical themes or narratives. I, I always as, as assumed it does so tangentially, you know, in uh, uh, approaching other themes that are, you know, more of a philosophical nature and again, perhaps ta tangentially theological. Um, I don't know why I never saw film uh, as a medium, um, you know, bringing, uh, uh, you know, supplementing any any of the any of the biblical themes. Um, I've, I, to my mind, it works just by just as a sort of dialogue. Um, for instance, of all the films that were based on on you know biblical stories on the life of Christ, for instance, or all 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 sorts of other attempts, uh, neither of these. They, they ended up being almost parodies of themselves. Um, so I wouldn't get too uh, hopeful uh, that film will be able to bring, you know, uh, some sort of um, complementary reading of, of the Bible or, or interpretation of uh, theological themes. Uh, directly, but indirectly, I think it will always do precisely that. What I, what, I, what I wanted to kind of mention is certainly a movies like Interstellar, which are trying in an intelligent way to tackle the, uh, all the problems that humanity can encounter in the future in a kind of semi-apocalyptic apocalyptic setting. And I didn't mean actually shooting shot for shot uh, things that were written in the Revelation. I'm just thinking kind of getting into that kind of mindset and being inspired and then producing something as a bridge between this moment and the moment of the final things. Yes, absolutely. As an inspiration, indeed. The ending of uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, as Rowley has 
has just said that that uh, yes that that I think you could say that uh, stylistically it has some points of connection with um, uh, the book of Revelation in that it uh, tries to project this um, idea of beyond uh, beyond time. Uh, Zoe has raised her hand. Sorry, Zoe. Um, I just actually typed it out. I mean, um, it seemed to me that two, the, the one thing that is very clear uh, about both the Book of Revelation and the um, and science fiction is that they both invite us to see that things do not have to be as they are. They invite us imaginatively uh, to see that, um, well, there are, there are alternatives, that it doesn't have to be like this. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and that's... What, this, what, could, this could either be utopian uh, or it could be terrifying. And uh, I have to admit that both the book of Revelation and a lot of science fiction is quite terrifying. Uh, uh, there's also a utopian strand in it as well. And I think that what you said, um, I mean, I don't think of the book of Revelation primarily in terms of future, as in terms of opening up uh, uh, a different way of seeing the realities which are the present. But, um, but what you said, the quest, I also wanted to ask the question about um, when you um, mentioned Pannenberg and you, you talked about the openness to what is, so you talked about the orientation to the future, yeah. but before that was the phrase openness to what is beyond us. And I think that's a very rich phrase in terms of that, that way he thought of theology, um, especially in the light of your very last quotation about the, the darkness all around the camp, the openness to what's beyond us, which could be pretty scary. Yeah, yes, I don't, I don't find science fiction very reassuring theologically, uh, uh, but it's a stimulus to thought, uh, a stimulus to feeling as well. Um, I, I think um, science fiction writers enjoy playing with theological ideas without any kind of um, constraint, actually, without any kind of dogma, without any kind of rules. Uh, they toss these ideas about. Obviously, some of them are working within a recognisable Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, but even then, they're often um, bending or breaking the rules of what you can say about God or the soul or human beings. Um, so I guess I find it quite exciting and quite terrifying and it, it forces me to think again and again about what actually I do believe I suppose. Um, as, as, as was probably clear from my um, talk I do have problems with the idea of the soul and resurrection and what that might be. Um, but uh, I don't have problems with the idea of a, some kind of creative power being responsible for the universe, uh, which I think, you know, the, all the kind of recent, you know, arguments about fine tuning and, um, you know, the, how the universe is so precisely adapted for intelligent life like ours. Uh, I really find that quite difficult to think that is just chance, that is just contingent, that just happened to be that way. Um, so I, I suppose, I don't know. I I find um, some aspects of religious belief possibly strengthened through science and science fiction, and some aspects brought into serious question. <laughs> uh, and you know, one just muddles along. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Rolly. Um, this has been very interesting. Perhaps we should take a break now. Uh, and then continue in about 10 minutes time. Yes, normally now we had, uh, uh, in situ, we have a, a longer uh, break with the uh, cookies and coffee and tea and such. But um, since we're deprived of these, uh, such luxury uh, during the pandemic, uh, we could stretch our leg legs perhaps for 10 minutes uh, or make ourselves a tea and then um, we can meet back here in the virtual classroom uh, at uh, quarter to eight, if that's okay. So see you all back here. <laughs>